The conversation you're about to listen to is part of our podcast series, Microdosing Table Talks. We speak with and learn from global experts in the microdosing space who help us explore microdosing in depth and from different angles. This is a new episode of Microdosing Table Talks. In today's conversation, my co-host Hein Pijnaken and myself, Jacobien van der Weyden, are about to dive deep into a topic that has interested us for a very long time now, microdosing with ayahuasca. And we do this with two uh, founders of Microwaska, uh, and that is Alvaro Zarate and Adolfo Schmidt. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Nice to be here. And yes, thank you for uh, thank you. for thank popping you. in here, four of us today. <laughs> So Microwaska is a Peruvian organization that facilitates microdosing programs with ayahuasca for people who want to microdose um, and also for professionals. They offer a training program for uh, facilitators. And Dr. James Faderman recognizes Microwaska as one of the leading voices in the microdosing movement. Uh, he is also the one who introduced us and we have been exchanging knowledge and methods and experience uh, since that time. And it's our honor to be doing this podcast and sharing the wisdom that you guys hold and put in practice uh, with our audience today. So again, welcome. And uh, I would love to ask to both of you if you could share a bit more about your personal and professional pathway. Uh, so what has led you to become the founder of Microwaska today? Okay, you guys. Well, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, I'm really happy to be here sharing with all who are listeners. So, well, some some uh, about me. I have worked for several years in the Peruvian Amazon uh, on forest engineering and conservation projects, uh, researching native fauna and flora, including ayahuasca and other medicinal plants. And, uh, well, I discovered the power of medicine at the age of 25, doing sessions in the northern jungle of Peru. Uh, during those years, ayahuasca helped me um, over time now to cultivate other senses of life. And I think that uh, therefore my, my confidence in the present, right? So it happens that in my case, uh, the medicine does not necessarily work with visions, colors or geometries, but with sensations and new understandings of myself um overall in challenging situations right so this is something that i have been understanding better with microdosing now i joined alvaro uh, in microwasca in 2020 uh just starting the pandemic um situation we all lived and it was like a eye opening for for me and for everyone who later add to this team right so well, that's my, my story in, a, in short. I want to give uh, some space to Alvaro, too. Thank you, Adolfo. Well, about me, uh, I have been working for, for many years in the, the startup world here in Peru, uh, working with social entrepreneurship initiatives, with incubators. And what took me through, through the medicine path, through the sacred medicines path, uh, was the... I saw that there was a, a something big, something different about how this kind of, of of substances or spirits open your consciousness to to a variety of of opportunities, right? Not not just mental health or or even self development, but even to to further things like uh, being more generous with others, to being more kind with others. So I, I thought, okay, here there's a a big space to to explore and to maybe this can be a tool to help humanity heal the world to heal and this is the path that, that we are we are walking through right now uh, i can tell you uh, as jackie you asked about how this connects to to microwaska to microwaska uh, i can tell you a little bit more of about our history uh, this actually started around 2018 19 as a part-time project for me. I was very into the, the startup world over, uh, in that, those years, but I started exploring. I started uh, joining with 
uh, mushroom cultivation groups here in, in Lima uh, through some people I knew about the, the, the possibilities of microdosing with ayahuasca since uh, ayahuasca has, a, as you know, a, a different legal status here in Peru. So we started approaching it with, with a lot of respect. But it, it wasn't until 2020 when the pandemic hit and when I reconnected with, with Adolfo and with Anna Platzer, who is, was also one of the earliest co-founders, uh, where, when we started this as a full-time project. 100% uh, of our time, even more, uh, was put into there. We started exploring, not just with close friends, but starting knocking doors with the general public, people we didn't know, uh, to start exploring uh, different tools we were creating with Adolfo, like a journal, like uh, some, some tools we might be able to talk about later. And also uh, this year, 2020, we started seeking uh, support and knowledge and, and wisdom from uh, scientists, from indigenous uh, organizations or indigenous uh, groups. We, we especially formed a, a really nice connection with the Shipibo, which are the, uh, the Shipibo Conibo, the, the tribe or the co indigenous group, which is most known with about their use with, uh, of ayahuasca. Uh, they're in Peru, they're in Colombia, in, in Brazil. So we started exploring uh, with a lot of respect to know to or to learn, sorry, how could we go on uh, with this project? Uh, was, was microdosing ayahuasca uh, the right path for us? Was, was this uh, something we should be pursing about? Was this not traditional? So there are many questions we might go over later. And uh, after all of this uh, exploring, uh, we started in 2021 creating our first program. We created a a six-week program for microdosers. We we added to our team uh, co-founders like Federico Infante, uh, the head of the Peruvian Transpersonal Association, a very respected uh, man in, in the transpersonal world uh, in Latin America. Uh, we also uh, started working with uh, Ronald Rivera as one of our co-founders. He's a curandero ayahuasquero, uh, very known here in, in Peru, in, in Pucallpa. Uh, he is really very interesting man. He's non dogmatic. He's very he has, he's a philosopher and, and a curandero. So we have very many interesting conversations there. And we started rolling out this program. Uh, now we have done uh, ten editions, eleven editions. We might we might go over this uh, later in in this in this talk. And now in this this year, twenty twenty two, we are exploring. Uh, more things uh, within the microdosing space about opening to community, about co-creation with commu in community. Uh, we started an organization called Cosmovision, which is a, a way for us to, to connect horizontally and in a decentralized way with other creators in the psychedelic space. Actually, that's one of the, the say, paths we, we have gone through with you guys in the Microdosing Institute. We have worked together in, in some interesting stuff. And also, uh, also with you guys, uh, the IMA, the International Microdosing Association that we have co-founded with Dr. Jim Fadiman and with you guys, Hein and, and Jackie. So we are on an interesting path now uh, and many things to, to talk about throughout this talk. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I look forward to to diving into all of this. Um, but maybe very first to really circle back to the beginning, because so many of us all around the world uh, probably know that ayahuasca is uh, becoming more and more popular as a plant medicine. But most people know it from ceremonies um, and it's very connected to the Amazon. Um, and yet you are probably one of the first who started offering this uh, internationally on a, a little bit of a larger scale uh, and where people microdose with ayahuasca. Um, so, yeah, what makes that such a special and different thing? And, yeah, and what? why do people actually want to microdose with ayahuasca? I can take that. Uh, it's, very, it's very interesting what you're asking because... Uh, they, us they usually have heard about, for example, its visionary or hallucinogenic or medicinal life-changing results, right? But this is yet, I mean, a far 
an accessible, mysterious or mystical. You know, there is a lot of um, of mystic around this topic, but people is also aware of the results and the benefits. Yet they can they they, are, they have uh, they have not a clear path to get closer to it, right? So for us, this is important too because this is a, a good starting point for a mind shift based on new comprehension of how ayahuasca really works with us, right? So I mean, from which we develop this 50 elements integration framework that that we can talk later, right? But um, yeah, people get close to ayahuasca because they want to heal, because they want to develop themselves, but or maybe because they are looking for these visions and colors and geometries they have heard about, right? Well, so they ended up discovering a lot of new things of how ayahuasca works, right? Well, it's important to say that we are not even close to be pioneers in, in ayahuasca microdosing. Uh, some of, of you might know that uh, indigenous groups, uh, indigenous healers have been using microdosing for centuries. Uh, we have been talking to, to some of these groups. We have learned some things about it. Uh, it's not like, okay, they don't put it in capsules like some, some people here uh, sell it but uh, they have been using it for example for with children with uh, even pregnant women even even pets <laughs> they learned about that a couple of months ago some of them microdose their pets uh, it's it's a lot of of, of controversy maybe about that that's the that, that segment some I'm, I'm just mentioning but it happens in in the tradition in the traditional world in some of course i'm not generalizing maybe some groups did it some healers did it uh, we, we cannot generalize, but uh, they have been using it uh, even to treat themselves. The curanderos used to treat themselves with microdosing. So uh, this, this is a, a very important thing. And now uh, one, one important uh, aspect about why people choose to, to microdose with ayahuasca or, or maybe in general is because they can bring this, this say, enlightening experiences uh, or results to their daily life. It's not the same when you go to a ceremony, a big ceremony, and you have these big revelations, and then you have to go back to to your daily life and, and integrate it. It can be hard. It's of course it's possible, and it happens a lot. But when we when we started uh, building these protocols for for microdosing ayahuasca and, and microdosing for weeks. Within while you are working in your in your daily activities, some some interesting aspects on, on integration or microdosing integration uh, appeared. So an integration is when you actually have the, the, all these insights, all these learnings, all these uh, new actions actually consolidate with you, hopefully through the rest of your life or or for a long period of time. So there there are very interesting learnings here in integration, and I think this is one of the the, the reasons people microdose with ayahuasca, or at least that people have looked for us to help them in their integration processes with, with ayahuasca. I mean, uh, something else that can work for people too. I mean, why people come to us is because, I mean, uh, con concretely depression, anxiety, any mental health conditions that they have been fighting for several years ago and they can, I mean, they are looking for alternatives. Right, and they have heard about ayahuasca, but they don't want to experience the ayahuasca trip as they have heard about, you know, or uh, or they, as Alvaro said, need to integrate things in daily life, or maybe they have experienced a, a challenging ayahuasca trip or ceremony, and they they need to understand what happened, right? So they come to us. There's a lot of profiles that come, but. I mean, everyone ended up discovering how it really works for them because ayahuasca not necessarily works from one side to for everyone, right? So yeah, that's uh, something to sum up. Yeah, we, we say that a lot as well. It's not a one size fits all, but it can definitely be a more uh, accessible way to work with the plant medicine and to intentionally work with the plant medicine so that you really get an opportunity to 
um, to do inner work and to experience um, some some of the benefits that yeah that would have been if you take only a ceremony or a higher dose they the benefits are kind of buried on top of each other and you all need to make sense of that uh, when you come back to your day-to-day -day life so yeah that that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah um, I, I, this is actually just out of curiosity I often hear like actually people sometimes generalize and say like oh in in the forest in the rainforest um, with the indigenous tribes uh, ayahuasca is used but in a different way they call it the medicine um, they don't have depression they don't have anxiety they live together, uh, take this together, and also integrate together. Um, is that something that you can talk about? Because, um, yeah, when you just started saying that um, microdoses are also used there for children or for specific cases. Um, yeah, I'm actually curious what your vision of this is from what you know. Okay, so this, you, you're right, totally right. You cannot generalize. It's a it's a kind of touchy subject because uh, sometimes people go to to the, the Amazon, they talk to one curandero and they just absorb what they say and take it as as the as the general truth. Okay, all this uh, indigenous group does this, or, or it's easy to generalize. Uh, of course, if you are in front of a a, a curandero, a healer that is wise, that is is actually helping you through through a process. And of course, you you ask your peers, okay, what what did this healer tell you? Uh, if it's similar, you started making making some some connections, right? So it's easy to generalize. Uh, and there's there are I don't know a number, but a lot of of indigenous groups that use ayahuasca in, in, in different uh, in, with different traditions, in different preparations. Uh, with different processes, uh, with different di dieta protocols. So the dieta is like the nutrition care that they they tell you to, uh, to nutrition and energy care they ask you to do. Uh, they're very different uh, traditions, and it can vary not even among indigenous groups or indigenous nations. It can vary within one specific indigenous nation, different healers. They can have their own processes, their own ways. Some healers can uh, even... Uh, not be very prepared, but they actually help you, and you 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 end up with the idea that okay, that's that's the that's the way, and that's what I will tell all my all my friends or to the media. So it's it's kind of touchy, it's kind of of of, of controversial maybe to 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 go deep into this 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 kind of conversations. But if I I should uh, tell you a message, and maybe Adolfo later you now you can tell us more about the, the indigenous groups you 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 know. That you say ayahuasca, but if I can tell you a message is uh, actually uh, ayahuasca. Actually, some people say they re it reaches to you when it's the time, when it's the place. Maybe okay, you, you end up traveling to Peru. Maybe you end up going to Colombia, or even in your own country, you meet uh, people, you a person you respect, a group that maybe they are not purely indigenous. Maybe they are mestizos. Like, like, Hybrids, I don't know the, the word in, in English, but uh, hey, you 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 trust this person, this person, you you uh, trust the process, and you heal uh, or you self develop, and it's all right. So probably that that that, that message could be okay. Trust the medicine. What's the medicine is telling you? Uh, listen to the curandero, of course. Uh, work with him or her, but at the end, uh, it, it's it's more about feeling it rather than trying to understand it with your cognitive part, which was is until now, it's very hard for me. I always try to go back to the cognitive and try to reason it, but hey, feel it. Uh, and it's this is kind of hard sometimes, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the medicine that helps you and how it's it's worked through by the people who, who prepare it or, or who, who offer it to you. Yeah. You know, I, I find very important to to know that there is a lot of techniques or ways to take ayahuasca in the jungle. Not not necessarily all the tribes do it in the same way, right? For example, there is one tribe that they don't even cook it. They chew it directly 
you know, and, and they get the benefits from the vine as we know it now worldwide as a only vine, right? But we, we do know that for one tribe that only chew it. So, for example, this is one example of many, right? And as well, by cooking, there is a lot of ways to cook, a lot of percentages or recipes, you know, or, or additives or additives. I mean, additives by other plant medicines, right? For any particular reason. I mean, not, not any, not all the chamans work in the same way. And not your condition is not the same condition as the other participant or the other patient of the chat that, that, that the chairman has. I mean, there's a lot of of things, you know. Um, we are maybe used to hear what uh, tourism has brought us was ayahuasca, what um, express uh, express ceremony <laughs> ayahuasca, like fast ceremony ayahuasca by tourism has give us so far, which is all this, you know, um, how do you say this in, 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 in English, like all the parafernalia, all the, all the, you know, all the decoration around, all the idea, the general idea around one thing is now globally understood like that, and it's not necessarily that way, you know, so there's a lot that also we don't know because they don't tell us or they tell us things that we don't, we do want to know. Or we do ask, and they say just yes, yes. This is like you are thinking, but you are thinking. You have to feel it and experience it, right? So there is a lot that we don't know, and this is also in a space to question what is tradition. If ayahuasca is also evo uh, evolutioning, if that's the word, sorry, like is evolutioning uh, alongside us, alongside humanity, right? So, well, that's uh, open questions that maybe has a lot of space to discuss. I don't know if here or now. <laughs> but it's an interesting topic, definitely. Yeah, this is super interesting. And this is also what I'm sensing a bit where the wisdom of plants and Mother Earth uh, is of a different nature, literally, uh, than what we, the type of wisdom or knowledge that we are used to, uh, which is very cognitive and, yeah, trying to bridge those worlds and maybe those um, tribes and the shamans specifically, they feel like, wow, that's a hell of a job to make someone coming from a different part of the culture uh, understand this because it, maybe it can only be felt or lived when you work with this for generations also, you know, it's it's... It has its own timing even, I would even think, yeah. But yeah, you described that very, very beautifully. Um, yeah, Hein, I remember we've been um, also in our community in the beginning, especially the first couple of years, um, we always got a lot of questions about ayahuasca and microdosing. Um, so maybe, maybe do you want to dive in a little bit about that? Like a lot of people actually wonder how to practically approach this. Yeah, yeah. You already mentioned a little bit for why why do people microdose with ayahuasca? Um, in in Holland, the the uh, the other compound DMT is is not legal. So in in Holland and uh, other places in Europe, uh, we only microdose with the capi vine. Uh, so the capi vine only. Um, is that the same as uh, in in Peru, or do you uh, microdose with uh, uh, the whole uh, the, the two uh, compounds? So the ayahuasca itself. We use both of them. We have tested both of them because, uh, due to the fact that you're telling us now that worldwide the only vine, the only capi vine is 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 more worldwide use. We um, tried we tried it here. And we found that in microdosis, uh, it's the same thing. In in in, this, in the in terms of uh, it, we have we have had the same results of uh, in terms of insights, in term in terms of transformational changes, uh, lasting transformational changes. Uh, so, yeah, we know traditionally here in Peru, um, they did. The, the chamans or the tribes, native tribes, use both of them. Only vine cooking and only and also with DMT, right? Uh, in traditional terms, the only vine uh, ceremony 
is more is more for purge, you know, for for um, physical or emotional purge. In our case, in microdosing, we have uh, seen the same results, as I said, in terms of uh, insights and lasting transformational changes. Right. So, yeah, both of them have been tested, at least in our participants in the program, and it has been as effective as it has been with DMT. Yeah, it's good to hear because we already uh, always had the theory like <clears throat> the when used in microdosing, uh, the copy vine is isn't uh, uh, hasn't enough strength to activate the DMT. So, so this could be like a like a small proof that. Uh, with, with, especially with microdosing, you don't need the DMT to have uh, a an, an potential healing effect or, or something like that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and then yeah, to and say that also with there are tribes that only uh, use ayahuasca with only the copy vine, and I think I think and and it's not only a Mao in inhibitor. It's I think there's a, a very strong healing power in the in the copy uh, vine. So. Yeah, some people focus on the visuals of the DMT, but for exactly. some people that only distracts from what they really, it's really a bod bodily experience. I've experienced it for myself a few months ago, a few weeks ago, uh, my first ayahuasca ceremony. And it was a, a brew that was mainly focused on the copy vine, uh, which was for me was really, really um, uh, special because I'm now in every cell of my body, there was awareness and insights and 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 and, uh, and revelations and those kind of things instead of in my head or focusing too much on the visuals or so uh, so the motivations and the intentions of of people who seek uh, or come to you for microdosing do they have the same intention intentions uh, that as uh, as doing higher doses and for that yeah uh, apart from from those who only seek. I mean, living experience. Uh, some other can look uh, for for healing or, and transcending, right? So these can be both micro or macro dose seekers. Uh, macro or high dose seekers usually think that this is the only possible. Uh, I mean, this is only possible through visions, colors, and, and geometry, what you mentioned before. Uh, because they have heard about ayahuasca trips, about I mean, uh, based on this, right? Distinct from the micro seekers who are afraid of the same thing, uh, of of living the of living the experience as they have been told it is, mainly meaning this like losing control of the, of his or her reality. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in terms of motivations, I think that is not differentiated by macro or micro. I think. I mean, apart from who, I mean, apart from the ones who only wants to live, the, only wants to live the experience, the the other ones can can uh, be, you know, uh, empowered by or afraid of the same thing, which is interesting too. Yeah, and I can add it. It has to do a lot with the narrative that tourism sells mm -hmm. sometimes. So what, what do some people that come here to Peru learn? Oh, okay, you are going to see these visions, you're going to see the past, the future. So it, it's, it's, it's sold very nicely, uh, very mystically. And some people go, uh, expect that. Some people don't, as, as Adolfo said. Actually, they fear that. But, uh, and even some, some, if I can go back to, to the previous question, some, some healers say that the, the, the colors, the geometry, are in the DMT, in the in the chakruna leaves, and the real healing comes from the the vine, the plant. I, I mean, you can you can question that, of course, but I think there's a lot of of power given to this narrative of the DMT. A lot of people, even uh, there are researchers studying just DMT, and there are a couple of 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 well, a couple. There are uh, a growing amount of of research just about the harmings, the, the, the vine components, which have a, a lot of, of healing properties. No? So going back to, to this, uh, this topic that Adolfo has been answering, uh, it, it's, it, can, it can be very interesting to see how, how microdosing just with, uh, with the copy vine uh, can, can lead people to, to lasting change. 
how they can actually have the time to integrate, to reflect. And we can later talk about facilitators and uh, so human support, uh, community support, people helping you uh, make make something out from this these insights you you get. But it's it's very interesting to, to see how the results uh, unfold. Yes, I, f- I feel like we, we can go into two different ways. I would love to hear more about actually what is coming out, what has come out in terms of research specifically to the harmings and specifically like what can ayahuasca do for our brain, for our well-being. Um, so, yeah, maybe one of you can dive a bit into that. And I think it's also very interesting to talk a bit more about the value of um, a facilitator or a coach or someone who accompanies you while you go on this path because we all start to see that this is uh, with plant medicine work it can make so much difference right so shall we go on the research path first <laughs> yeah 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 uh, it's it's very interesting that you bring this topic right now because we are talking about the only copy uh, issue topics you know and uh, um in fact, all the research about uh, the the capivine substance or psycho psychoactive sus- substance, which is called harmins, as you said, they have been tested for neurogenesis with a hundred percent of effectiveness in proliferation of uh, neuronal uh, cells and also in the protection of these proliferated cells. So, this has led to the the, the researchers to um, preclinically tested for memory and and um, learning, and this at the same time has led to uh, related RNA study for uh, Alzheimer and Parkinson and other uh, immune uh, autoimmune diseases or diseases with with a without a, or a known origin, right? So yeah. This is like the, the path of the research of, of Harmins. And the reason they are now more famous or famous beyond the, the first thing that, they, that we do, did know about the Harmins that was the imaus, that they, they uh, allowed the DMT to work on our bodies. Beyond that, we, we do know na- now that Harmins are useful for neurogenesis, neuroprotection, you know, and um, and then obviously memory, learning, and these other diseases we uh, they are they are studying right now. And we hear we we hear. I mean, from this is like the the modern science, the neurophysiological approach, for saying some way. And from our approach, things that we have been watching here in our participants, uh, we we have seen a contribution to uh, or improvement of things like psoriasis or uh, ulceras how do you say them in uh, in english like uh, in intestinal bleeding for example um gastritis gastritis i don't know how to say in english sorry yeah so there are some some diseases or conditions physical uh, health conditions that are not explained so, i mean they can, can be explained but can be understood by other ways, you know, like from the emotional side or the spiritual side. So, well, that's what we have been watching here, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. similar that that the government in Peru also uh, approved the addiction treatment center to do the research, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, it's also a disorder that. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of people. I, I I might be missing a large list of conditions. Sorry, maybe I'm blocked right now. <laughs> but now that you mention addiction, one of the uh, most effective things that we have uh, overcome is addiction uh, in alcohol and uh, nicotine. And this is and this is always related to, for example, healing uh, family uh, issues or transgenerational issues or emotional stuff. Yeah, so it has to be a lot. And and is it, do you think, is it still a matter of finding out if this is, um, if all these research results um, are to be replicated when people microdose? Because 
is it that these are mostly applied to ceremonial doses or higher doses and that we actually have to see like how does this translate to the reality of microdosing or do you already know something about that? I think it's tricky because mm. the more you know, the, the more you uh, condition yourself to something, right? And I mean, starting from the, the fact that all these uh, scientific advancements are one of the approaches of how the medicine works. The, our, uh, it's like our actual understanding of how medicine works. It's like our first step, baby steps of how this works. But this could, you know, like, um, you know, like blind yourself to what really means to work with the medicine and microdosing and be being perceptive to the subtleness and work with that in the emotional, spiritual and cognitive side. You know, all that other side can be just blinded because you are more, you know, focused on the neurophysiological approach, which is which is very important, but complement, you know, so that's why I think it's tricky. And and what is in this the role of the facilitator because you're mentioning it already a little bit like people can go into a tunnel vision or have these kind of blind spots for all that is happening because they focus on I want to heal this or I want to fix this and I've heard that the medicine can do that for me um, so I'd love to hear a bit more about how do you guys yeah work and what the role of it is a facilitator is once someone starts to you know really embark on this journey from day one with their microwasca, um, sorry, with their microdoses of ayahuasca. Uh, so about human support, we call it human support because for there's one component, one element which are, are the professional support. Let's say therapists, coaches, healers that can help you. Uh, we also have the uh, the dimension of of community, peer support that the people that, that are maybe on the same boat as you that you can just just by sharing to your therapist, to your peers, to a, a, gr a group of, of a community that's going through the same process for the first time maybe with you, can unlock a lot of things. Can just, just saying it can make you realize, oh, okay, I'm just verbalizing something that I, I, I hadn't thought about before. Maybe they have used even a journal, but verbalizing to a group it can, can do wonders. And also hearing it from others, uh, hear the... Uh, I'm not talking about the facilitators, but about the community or the peers. When you listen to them about their experiences, oh, uh, uh, this thing that this, this this girl is saying, it has to do is kind of similar to what I'm I'm going through. Uh, let's talk about it more, or, or or now I understand some things. It, it can be very subtle, uh, and you can even laugh about it, but it's that simple sometimes. And of course when we talk about professional support, uh, and then Adolfo, I think it, he can complement a lot about this, uh, with a, a, an experienced therapist or coach that can help you in, in special ed cases. For example, you have depression, you have anxiety, you have a severe symptoms of, or of something. Uh, this, this is not as, as easy, for, if, if, if I'm saying the right word. Uh, like, for example, if you are microdosing for self-development or or want to be make better your productivity, which is some of the narrative that sometimes microdosing is is, is being talked about. But actually, it, it um, uh, let's say you unearth more things be beyond that wish to be productive. So maybe you unearth that you actually have a severe trauma from childhood, something that is not very easy to confront just with a peer or just by going through your internal teacher sometimes you need uh, professional support and, and we have been learning a lot of very interesting things with with our facilitators I also maybe can complement with that well yeah I think that one of the most important um, uh, work with the, of the facilitator is like first working with expectations right there is a lot of expectations uh, unless, I mean, there's a lot of expectations and the facilitator works with that initially. And then it's uh, also very important that they um, help users or participants to be aware of what's happening because maybe, I mean, and it's, I mean, more often, it's very often that 
we we as humans tend to just go with the rhythm, go with the flow of the daily life, and don't be perceptive as what's happening, right? So when something happens differently and you don't get aware of it, you are missing and learning. So that's what the, why the facilitator is there to make that uh, happen in some ways or in some cases. So this is, I mean, rounding it, rounding it up is about working with expectations at the first. And then, of course, this uh, leads to work with dosification, calibration, which is another method and protocol we have uh, as a part of all the protocol of Macrowasca. And so it, it also derives into the consciousness and responsibility, the autonomy that the participants have to decide on what's best for each one of them. So this is another way to you know, give uh, a supported responsibility and autonom uh, being autonomous. I don't know how to say that in English. Um, I mean, from, from the user, from the participant, not necessarily depending on a therapist or someone or any professional. So it's, it's, it's about cultivate the self-knowledge, the self-consciousness, the, the, the responsibility, the autonomy, you know, and go along with it. That's one of the things that facilitator cultivates in his participant. Yeah, be beautiful. It's, it's also, uh, I think for many people, a paradigm shift because, yeah, some people think, oh, I need my therapist. Like, I need my therapist to help me heal. And then they give away some of their autonomy of their process of healing and some of the autonomy of their own inner healing intelligence. Um, they, they give that power away. Right. They give that away to someone else. And I think there is a tendency to also do that with even with a plant medicine to give that power to the plant. Um, we ha we see it sometimes in our community. Oh, I didn't have a much of an effect with um, psilocybin mushrooms or truffles. Maybe I should try this other medicine or substance. And what you are actually saying is, no, people have their own autonomy, but they can be supported by others in their group. Uh, by peers and they can be supported by a therapist um, but they will work with the insights and all that comes up uh, they will work with that themselves it's it's their it's their process right they own it yeah, yeah most important is that they understand that they uh, that they understand that they are the main character in the story and that healing is within yourself using a plant medicine as as support, but it's not uh, the plant medicine that heals you. It's yourself that's your healing. And it only shows you the way. Yeah, I just want to say that another argument yeah, yeah, yeah. that we hear no, 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 no. I mean, from, from, from other therapists is that your medicine is not working at the same as a week ago. or <laughs> And that's something that uh, also is explained by, by what we're talking right now, right? Uh, there's something about the attitude and mentality. Uh, attitude and mentality has to do with expectations, that I also said. It has to do with mental barriers or openness, and has to do with the, how uh, compromised are you with your process. So these three things, which are, are, are part of a framework we call the, the 50 integration elements, they are uh, around mentality and attitude. And we have, we get it a lot. The people that say, hey, this medicine is not working. I will try with another medicine. Ayahuasca doesn't work for, for me, but, but mushrooms work. But maybe it's, it's the, the moment in time they took it, the, the, the attitude they had, the, the expectations they had about the substance. And, and, and there's something that we, we, we have been talking about a lot with, with you guys about demystifying the substance. Some people are, are too adamant about uh, putting additives and let's mix this microdose with this and with that to have, have more effects or better effects. But it has to do with what Adolfo, Adolfo said a, a while ago. Uh, sometimes you just need to stop and, and, and see what, what's happening in my life that it's maybe a little bit different, but I'm learning from that if I, if I get aware of it. And that's why, where a facilitator or, or a peer of, or a community come, come in handy. Sometimes you just don't realize that something's happening. And people say, now people, uh, uh, sobre todo, above all, people who have a lot of mental barriers, they say the medicine is not working. And they have high doses uh, within the microdosing spectrum, right? We, we use from 5 to 20%. They have the higher 
uh, 20% dose, they say, it's not working. What, what's happening? Your, your medicine is, 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 is bad or, or whatever, right? And, and their peers are, are, are feeling stuff with, with 5%, but it's not about feeling or, or, or trying to associate it with or relate it to a physical uh, feeling. But it's actually, okay, what am I learning from this small thing that I perceived today? And that can make a difference. And that's why we, we talk about uh, facilitators can, can make, a, in, a, in six weeks, can make you, or, or open you, especially if you have high metal barriers, open you to, to a huge set of learnings in a, in a short time. Yeah, it's good that you emphasize this because this is <clears throat> a very common thing when it comes to microdosing. And then that's the difference what I said before. Like if people think it works for me, then most of them, they get a little bit disappointed because, yeah, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> and um, sometimes I have to laugh that people say, I get irritated by microdosing if I take a microdose. And it's like, okay, maybe it's just emphasize what's already in you that you are irritated by something and it tries to make you aware of those those feelings and uh, yeah but um yeah thank you for sharing this it it also uh, makes me think of um also many many discussions we have with with our community and and with experts everywhere um additional practices so how do you feel about um, additional practices such as meditation or um, you guys are working with uh, Ronald who um, who sings Icaros. Uh, so, you know, we know that other, other practices also um, uh, really can impact someone's process and can generally impact our, um, our health and our well-being. Um, so how do you see this... Um, this this uh, synergy work and um, maybe you even have some stats or examples from your groups of what do people start do what's what do they naturally start to um, incorporate into their lifestyle do you see any lifestyle changes in this sense as well yeah I, I can start with this uh, this is something we call amplifiers which are in, in their own in in their own they come they are tools or portals. To, to access expanded states of, of consciousness, like meditation, like breath work, like physical exercise, like, well, we have a lot of things that can, even practicing arts can make you expand your conscience or your state of consciousness. And of course, psychedelics are quicker, are faster, are more, I don't know if the word is powerful, but you get my idea. So when you combine them, some interesting uh, things can happen. Uh, one of, I'm forgetting, uh, music, the Icaros, that you said, the, the, sing, the music that healers sing, but it can be other kinds of music. It can be that just being in contact with nature. We, we, we ask our participants in, our, in their first or second week to just go to nature, wherever they are, if, if they're in, this, in the city, they go to a park and take off your, your shoes and your socks and just put your feet on the ground and just, be in contact with nature, and this can uh, help them go deeper even in, in, in their experiences they, they are having. And I'm sure Adolfo has, has a lot of, of, of cases he has heard about with our participants. Well, yes. Um, I was actually thinking that, as you, uh, as you mentioned, Alvaro, uh, these, uh, these practices by themselves already generate an expansion of the consciousness. What I think amplifiers do is to focus or canalize our senses to something to, or, I mean, canalize the, our senses, our expanded sense, senses to understand something new about ourselves. Because, I mean, in, I mean, anyhow, this is a way to respect our personal space by doing something that connects with our body and our senses. So in some way, is that we we do amplify also with microdosing by itself. But maybe by microdosing by itself, we also expand our state of consciousness. And these practices too by themselves. But when we combine that, we are canalizing these sense our sense our own senses as a tool to understand something new. And maybe uh, one or another 
can can make more sense for one or another person, right? From depending on which is the state or the context he or she is living in that moment. So, uh, or the skill or the thing that they need in general terms, right? So, yeah, they're a good combination. But I was actually thinking when I started talking about that, that, uh, for example, there are some cases that we have to take care about. For example, we had uh, once a uh, yoga teacher. This yoga teacher really, um, I mean, she she uh, did yoga I mean, all day long. She already generates a lot of, uh, a lot of serotonin. And when they start by uh, microdosing, what happened to her was that the uh, insomnia, right? <laughs> she started with insomnia. And we have to reduce uh, at the minimum level the microdosing because she is starting overproducing serotonin, which is the serotonin syndrome, right? So we have also take take care of that aspects. They are not like life or death aspects, but they're important and we have to take to be aware of it also, right? Uh, yeah, so it depends on what. I think there are magnitudes of amplifiers, as we mentioned. Uh, it's a coincidence that, that, that he mentioned the insomnia, Jacobin, because we were uh, discussing this uh, this subject, uh, uh, insomnia, that, that if people take a too high a dose of uh, microdose uh, and people have already insomnia, yeah, we have to look into it that it's not a risk that they be overactive and get anxiety from that or something. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it could go. This was another case, right? Because this is what uh, Adolfo just mentioned was someone with already a lot of serotonin and then uh, getting extra serotonin by release of more serotonin than usual or than what is even good for you. Um, I think that could even be called the serotonin syndrome, correct? And, um, and, and, and actually a lot of people are scared of that. So maybe we can dive in a little bit more and see if this is actually a, a big risk or not. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned, Hein, was actually someone who has insomnia. And if they take a high dose of psychedelics, it can just cause them um, a lot more time to process their journey and to process and to integrate and to get out of their journey. So just because the body is so much slower because of the lack of sleep. So yeah, and it can go many ways too. So I, all I can say about this with certainty is like, never underestimate the power of sleep. <laughs> That's all that we know, but we want to dive in more of that as well. Yeah. But do you have any concrete or uh, maybe simple advice for people who are worried about serotonin syndrome? And who are interested uh, the, in, in microdosing is not so it's not so usual. I mean, it's it's really not so usual. Maybe when micro when macrodosing maybe. Uh, but anyway, I mean, be aware of, for example, um, uh, heart rate. You know, when when it increases heart rate, or when it increases anxiety, or um, sweating on the palms, or sweating on the body. That's some kind of symptoms that may. I mean, may uh, indicate that is uh, that has something to do, but also these symptoms, for example, anxiety or tiredness, you know, or um, can also be the first organic symptoms that we have to attend before the medicine start working with us deeply. You know, so just take time. I mean, if if someone who's listening us right now about this. Um, serotonin syndrome is listening. If you have the symptoms, just take some time, maybe a week, to observe yourself on what's the the path that these symptoms are are taking. Try to to attend the organic needs that also comes out, come out, and observe yourself, so you can uh, decide what's happening. Right, that's my suggestion. Something interesting that this this can bring the, the talk about benefits and challenges. So uh, and we we actually wrote a, a blog post, Adolfo and me, for for Microdosing Institute. You can check it out. And we talk about sometimes people, uh, microdosers, see okay, I'm I'm having uh, secondary effects. Uh, I, I'm I'm getting too sleepy. 
uh, this is bad. Microdose, microdosing is, is doing something bad for me. But actually, in our experience, I think 100% of people who were more sleepy in their first week or, or first or second week on microdosing were actually people who were two workaholics and that never gave themselves spaces to rest. And okay, what's the medicine trying to tell you? Okay, have a rest. And sometimes people, okay, I don't want to rest. I, I have to work. So sometimes it's, it's a struggle. But of course, uh, we actually tell these things to our participants or to our candidates before participating and, and they let them be weary that some things like this can happen and they have to give themselves some space to, to let's say, confront these challenges. There are, and there can be, like, uh, like Heinz said before, irritability. I'm more irritable. I, I'm usually very tolerant. Uh, and this happened to us with, uh, actually, we have a, a healer, uh, uh, a plant medicine healer that went through a program. And he was, uh, he's a very nice person, very tolerant. And he started uh, experiencing irritability. Okay, what, what's this telling you? Okay, maybe I'm too tolerant sometimes. So, uh, and, and this, uh, sometimes you don't, you don't notice it by yourself. Sometimes a facilitator or your peers can, can help you unearth this. Uh, but these challenges in most of the times, of course, we are very careful. We see each, if, if participant case by case, but most of the times these secondary effects are actually uh, signs of you to where to heal or where to put your, your energy into or where to look for help, which is very interesting as a process. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I noticed we're, uh, we've already covered a lot of ground and um, um, just thinking what, what more is important for this conversation. Um, so I'd actually like to take a look uh, into the future, the near future, and just ask you, hmm, maybe in terms of uh, challenges and benefits, I'd love to hear what do you see is or will be a challenge for either the microdosing field or professionals who are working with microdosing or microwaska or yeah the community what could be a challenge in the near future that you see that hey this is something that should be worked on or that there's a shift needed and i also would like to know if you see a big benefit um, uh, for the world and for what ayahuasca can bring us. So I really like to ask you these questions, both your challenge I can, your I can concern start. and your benefit. Yeah, I can start because I've been constantly thinking that um, in a way that, that, I mean, if legalization is really what, it, what, what we have to do now, because what, 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 what will happen if legalization comes only based on this the modern scientific approach you know um, basis I think that 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 would maybe uh, promote the recreational use of the medicine and I I do think then that what we are doing in, in microwasca and and other organizations too what we are doing is to like uh, complement, you know, this argue, this argument of this, or, or this, um, yeah, this argument of the modern scientists on these plant medicines of how they work. We are complementing that to nurture a single base, you know, to to avoid that recreation, that recreational use just explodes because now it's legal. So my warning about legalization is that a recreational use can explode. So we are like building up all these arguments that not only has to come from the, the modern science approach, which is very limited, but the responsible and conscious uh, or consciously uh, use therapeutic use of these medicines. Um, so I think that's something that we should all we uh, be looking, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can complement that uh, about legalization and or decriminalization, something that, of course, we are in another side of the world. Uh, in Peru, we don't feel that with ayahuasca. We are in, a, in it, it's, it's not actually regulated. There's some, some caveats there, but uh, we can use it. 
so we are not feeling that specifically. But of course, uh, you can see here that the tourism that goes uh, around ayahuasca, some expectations that people have, some of this maybe try to see the colors and that. I'm not saying that, uh, on, on the other hand, that what Adolfo said, recreational use, it depends on how you see the recreational side, right? Some, some people even say recreational sometimes can be therapeutic. I, we can question it, we can talk about it a lot. But of course, uh, at least from our from the, the spot that we are in, we look at, at these plants, especially ayahuasca, uh, with a sacred respect, uh, with a let's say therapeutic uh, end, therapeutic purpose. People, I mean, people can be free to use MDMA, MDMA in a, in a party, or they can. This is, this is another touchy sub subject, but uh, since we are looking at, at a lot of of, of great uh, results and great changes that, that a single plant medicine can do uh, with your, for your health, we would rather focus on the therapeutic, uh, let's say, objectives that this can bring. And this also, uh, now that we are talking on legalization, and Adolfo said this, this, uh, this is very important what Adolfo said, it has to do with... Uh, the, the modern science way of looking at it. So sometimes it's, it's okay, wh where do modern science uh, is taking uh, psychedelics or, or, or microdosing, let's say, uh, in, in, the, in the current state, to f the pharmaceutical model, to the pharma industry. So, and that's where the money is, and that's, that's where the investments come from. And sometimes, okay, you, you can find some some companies that are, are, are responsible, but some others you can question, okay, do you want to patent things? Do you want to own things? Do you want, okay, but the, actually the plants teach you something very different about ownership, about, about accumulating stuff. So, and, and then another person can tell me, but who are you to, to restrain the, these people from the freedom of doing that? So there's another touchy subject. But of course, uh, we would not want the, the companies to arise and say, okay, I, I, I'm patenting this. Nobody can use this, this, not only this medicine, but this protocol, this way of, of, of using this, because if, if you use it, you have to pay us or you can. So, so if the, the final objective is to make people better, why will you go through paths like open science, like DSI, like uh, these, these new movements that, that, that we are seeing right now about how to make this more accessible to people and, and not that complicated, maybe not, don't, don't try to go to, to turn everything on every investment on every, on every effort through the I and D path, to, through the R and D path, sorry in English, but maybe uh, as, as we are doing, I'm not saying that we are we are doing it better, but uh, we we have since we don't have this funding, we're exploring and, and this is legal here in Peru or this is not illegal. We're exploring an, a minimum viable product approach. Okay, we we launch this 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 program, this therapeutic model, these therapeutic protocols. We try it with people with with a lot of of of, of safety, with a lot of, of 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 protocols around it, and see how this at the end of the program achieves a successful or a beneficial microdosing process. I, I, we, don't, we don't start looking very granularly at, okay, how the, their serotonin levels have changed it, how, how the, the neurons have uh, spliced or, or whatever. Okay, are you better than you were before? Uh, and, and is this long lasting? Is this just an experience? Can you, uh, we, we, we actually talk to our participants one month, three months, one year after that, are you still uh, feeling better? You, do you need more? So some, sometimes it's about questioning uh, what, why are we doing what, what we are doing? And at, at the end of the day, it's actually to make participants or users be better, transform. And, and I think that should be our, our North Star in, in every scientific uh, endeavors that have to do with psychedelics at least. Yeah, totally aligned with that. Jim Fetterman also mentions this always. Like in the end of the day, it's all about are you having a really good day and not only measuring all types of research things. And um, yeah, great. 
Yeah, I don't know, but uh, I I do want to touch on a little bit of a practical thing also uh, before we uh, uh, continue, because I have a few questions on how do you, uh, with your uh, program, how people microdose, uh, what kind of protocol do they use, and uh, do they use it in a tincture, do they use it in a capsule? Can you tell a little bit more about that? It's it's a little bit off topic of what we talked about, but I wanted to... No, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, we started from the Fadiman schedule. We, well, I mean, he mentioned he don't want to... We don't want to... He, Sorry, he doesn't want us to mention his protocol as a protocol, so he's, he's in a schedule. It's, um, you know, uh, stepping, skipping two days, you know, like taking one day, skipping two. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we adapted this as uh, um, through a dosing uh, calibration and dosing protocol, uh, which starts from the first week of intake. They increases voluntarily increases from five to ten to fifteen to twenty percent of the of macro dose. Um, they start taking it by skipping just one day. You know, they are. This is this is an increment. This is a voluntary increment. I- increment, um, and this is for for them to ha- to have the first contact with the medicine and how it works in certain context. After that, every time uh, the participants take the microdose, uh, the microdose, they decide how much are they gonna take based on the context they are living that day the, on, uh, and on also the previous knowledge about uh, how do they or how the, the medicine works with them in certain certain dosages. Um, it's liquid all around the world. We Before we had capsules, but now we, we work with uh, liquid, with uh, substance as it is. Uh, we measured by, I mean, when we talk about 5 to 20%, it can be from 1.5 milliliters to 10 milliliters. From, I mean, this depends on a range. I mean, the, the, these percentages are, are uh, a percentages from, uh, a macro, a macro dose of in a ceremony. This macro dose in a ceremony can be between 30 and 60 milliliters, depending on the case. So, depending to on what which medicine are, is the participant going to take in every country, well, this calculation is made, so they exactly know what five, ten, fifteen, or twenty percent. In in uh, some conditions or some cases, for example, uh, there are people that are more sensitive, or uh, they are. Um, well, more sensitive or have a certain health conditions, they can start from the half of 5%, right? And increment also lower. So, yeah, that can happen too. Yeah, so our thing is, our protocol is uh, a one week of calibration with with one day skipping uh, of increment. And then the, the, the Fadiman schedule, uh, deciding on which dosage you have to take based on everything I mentioned before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and I can add to this as well. Uh, actually, uh, this this protocols you can apply a protocol to to many aspects. For example, Adolfo is is talking about a protocol in dosage and calibration, or a protocol in scheduling. There are actually more aspects. Uh, wh- uh, this is what we call the, the integration elements, wh- which are, we have 50 integration elements that we have uh, seen in our experience that can impact or be impacted in a microdosing process. And this, this can also apply um, to macrodosing processes, as, as we have seen. But for example, you, have a produ- you can have protocols for setting an intention. You can have protocols for nutrition care like dieta, like medications and supplements, like stimulants, like other substances. You can have protocols for, for uh, confronting your mental barriers. You can have protocols for, for navigating your expectations, to navigating your commitment to the process. Uh, something that, that we learned from, from our curandero is that the dieta, what they call it in, in the, the ayahuasca world, 
it's, it's about refraining or, or taking care from not just nutrition, but also energy care. And within energy care, you can have protocols as well, which we use. For example, protocols for leisure. How do you approach leisure? How do you have, a, approach money and materialism? How do you approach sexuality? E even uh, the feminine cycles, menstruation, ovulation, it, it has an impact. And even the use of electronic devices, they have an impact on, on your microdosing or micro macrodosing processes too, or, 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 or concerns, then situations. Even if you if you go to a funeral, this can affect you. So there are many things that uh, th these are in the this guest blog post that we have shared with with Microdosing Institute. We have uh, uh, detailed all all of the the fifty elements, and this can impact your process. It's not just about the substance. People worry too much about the substance, which is important. Of course, it's one of the, the 15 integration elements. How do you approach a substance? What's your relationship with a substance? Which substance do you use? How do you take it? Of course. But sometimes we miss the point that we only focus on that because, and, and this is my hypothesis, my personal view, it's easier to think about what's outside that rather working out stuff on your on the inside right so uh, i invite you every any, anyone who's watching to to go through to take a take a look at this this integration elements and if you are microdosing see okay maybe if i change this if i work through this can this make my process go better can this make my insights go deeper can this make my my actions my transformation go in, in, a, in a better pace and sometimes they they do and that, that, that's mm -hmm. where facilitators can come in handy as well. But uh, we're working, of course, in, in, in several uh, pieces of content about how to navigate each integration element that we will, of course, share it with, with you as soon as we have it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, and if uh, any viewers or listeners, please leave it in the comments if you have something to, uh, to tell about this or your own experience. So that's always nice to read. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 for for how long can you take a micro, a microdosing for ayahuasca? What do you advise? Not longer than one month or two months? Or well, um, what we offer here, based on experience, is short program, which is uh, six weeks, and a long program, which is fourteen to eighteen weeks. Uh, the long program is recommended for. Uh, the, uh, several depression, several anxiety, or several other conditions that may have a lot of uh, years, um, you know, nurturing. Um, and I mean, I, in our experience, we have learned that this is like a prudent, prudent. I don't know if that's, that the word exists, like a a prudent time. <laughs> To, to be to, to be assist. careful, right? Um, to be careful, thank you. Yeah, to be careful mm -hmm. about this this kind of cases. I mean, uh, cases of depression or anxiety. Several several cases of, of this one, these types, have been overcome in this sense. Obviously, there's uh, some other cases that need some reinforcement after a long program. So it's it's in a case by case basis, basically. Yeah, uh, what's important here is that it, you don't get dependent on the substance because you work consciously with the plant medicine. Uh, so this is a constant progressive work, personal work. You, I mean, we haven't yet, or we haven't participants that so far has uh, have take a microdose for the same reason and with the same effects or with the same results. So they always uh, work something different and it's always evolution, you know, and progression. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about that. Yeah, beautiful. It's uh, what, what I'm hearing in, in all of this is besides these practical guidelines, uh, which are very useful and very handy and also needed in order to approach this you know not too intuitively you need a bit of a protocol to um to be to be structured and to be serious and then you can <clears throat> use this medicine with a lot of respect and then at the same time you have the empowerment from what i've heard from you guys there's a lot of focus on the empowerment of the person to really take care of their own process and 
uh, stay open to all the possibilities, all the 50 elements that impact their process and that they can use to integrate, to find learnings and integrate them. And I think it's about keep, keep on inviting this person to reflect upon all of those and to, you know, um, that's, that's the real work. And um, I think this is something really, truly unique. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Um, I think this is also something that's very important in this whole space of plant medicine, that we move past the, um, I don't know what it's, what it's called sometimes, magical rainbow thinking of this exotic plants and mysterious plant teachers um, but we look back again at ourselves and, hey, what can I do to uh, to feel better? What are my needs? Uh, what do my surroundings look like? What does my energy look like? And what is affecting me in this life? And then how can I be of service if I want to take things to a next level to to others? And how can I spread my, you know, growth and happiness? And um, Yeah, I think yeah. this is, uh, I, I, I also this is a beautiful... To... Uh, way to do that I, I also want to add that working this way also impacts on sustainability which is another big question that people does maybe here too uh, but uh, in terms of that we are not pretending that people takes ayah take ayahuasca forever it it obviously impacts on the, the requirement of ayahuasca right so working consciously impacts directly on sustain sustainability that's something I wanted to to add here. Yeah, yeah. So very important one. Yeah, yeah. So you can use this medicine with respect, and it also means when to end your pro your yeah your process or your your use of it and continue uh, with your own learnings with your inner inner healer. Yeah. Okay, I think, guys, um, this has been really beautiful. Thanks for bringing in all this really important stuff. Uh, yeah, we covered a lot. Um, can I just invite you one more time to maybe speak about if people are interested to um, to microdose with ayahuasca with your facilitation uh, and or to become a uh, facilitator? Um, how can they reach you and what is important for them to uh, to know? Okay, uh, so now for the first time we are launching our program in English. We have been through 10 successful editions in Spanish and we are starting on the October 3rd, 3rd uh, with our program for microdosers, six-week program for microdosers uh, with micro for microdosing ayahuasca and also our training program for professionals uh, with a special uh, let's say, focus on facilitating microdosing processes. With ayahuasca, we have been uh, working with other plants, but our main expertise is with ayahuasca. Um, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, we have been having uh, a lot of facilitators that came and were graduated from our, our programs now in Spanish. They have been having the opportunity to work uh, after they graduated with uh, facilitating our users from our, our programs, users for, or participants from other programs. Uh, and something else I wanted to add is that we are also uh, starting to work since we have some, let's say, uh, legal or bureaucratic flexibility here in Peru. We are inviting uh, professionals in psychedelic uh, fields to knock our doors if you want to collaborate or if you we want you want us to collaborate with you uh, we have been doing it with some organizations microdosing institute is, is one of them uh, and there's some interesting opportunities that are, can come up from from working horizontally from working as a team from working uh, focusing on on the participant on the user on the microdoser on the or on the psychedelic user rather than uh, on the product or on the on the patents on well whatever I, I said before about this thing. So we have uh, a new organization, it's called Cosmovision. Uh, the website is cosmovision.cc and we are starting to to welcome uh, new projects that uh, that want to to work with us to they need you need facilitators, you need uh, uh, maybe to to 
uh, work through regulations in your, that in your country are complicated, uh, we have some, some ways to, to work together. So I invite you to, to say hi, and we, we will answer, reply to you ourselves. That sounds amazing. It sounds almost like a practical think tank for the psychedelic space. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I think Hein is also speaking. Let me just say goodbye and thank you so much for this conversation. And um, yeah, yeah, wishing yeah. you all the best uh, with all of your amazing work. Okay, yeah, and I want to also address uh, Ed, you also. Uh, Co uh, mentioned um, uh, Cosmovision, but uh, one of our projects, the International Microdosing Association, uh, I would highlight that also. So if you are a professional, we've launched a, a, a platform uh, where we can come together with uh, all microdosing professionals, researchers, entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, visit us at uh, microdosingassociation.org. And yeah. Thank you, Alvaro and Adolfo. Thank you. Gracias, amigos. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. See you. If you are enjoying this podcast and learning from it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is a wonderful zero-cost way to support Microdosing Institute. Also, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on SoundCloud and Spotify, where you can leave us up to a five-star review. This will help us reach more microdosers and provide them with valuable information. If you have feedback for this podcast or topics that you would like to see covered, anything that can help us deliver more valuable information to microdosers, leave this in the comments on YouTube, which we all read and incorporate. To keep learning from us and with us, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter on microdosinginstitute.com, in which we provide insights, learnings, science, and resources that allow you to get the most out of any microdosing cycle. Last but not least, you are warmly invited to be an active member of our microdosing community. This is absolutely free of charge. Typically, our community members are joining the discussions on Discord or other social media channels, and they may also join our monthly online meetup or workshops led by experts, or they may participate in citizen science projects and academic studies. Go to microdosinginstitute.com community, and all of this is only a few clicks away. Thank you for listening and thank you for exploring microdosing.